Today we look at a paper by Tyler and myself called An Economic Theory of Avant-Garde and Popular Art. In this paper, Tyler and I use economic theory to try and explain some of the style and the content of art. In particular, we look at the following questions. Why do some artistic media offer greater scope for the avant-garde than do others? Why do so many artists dislike the market? Why is high and low culture split over time? And how does economic growth affect the quantity and form of different kinds of art? Let's take a look. A key idea underlying many of the results in the paper is that artists produce and consume their own work. So artists are interested not just in money sales, but also in fame, in critical appraisal, and perhaps most importantly of all, in producing an artwork which satisfies their own tastes, their own desires. Indeed, many artists are driven to produce an artwork which satisfies their own internal demands. And it's understanding how artists navigate this trade-off, the trade-off between money sales and artistic self-satisfaction, how that trade-off is navigated under different constraints, that's going to help us to explain our earlier questions. Here's a simple model of the trade-off. Let S denote a measure of the artist's satisfaction from their artwork. So S is a subjective measure of quality from the point of view of the artist. The wage is going to be a function of S. Now, if the wage increases in S, say, along this portion of the curve, then, of course, the artist will take more of both things that he wants, a higher wage and greater artistic self-satisfaction. However, artists who care about their own satisfaction from the art will not want to stop at the art level which most satisfies the public. They will be willing to take a lower wage in return for a quality of art which, according to their own subjective opinions, is, is a higher level, a better level, a more satisfying level. So the question then becomes, when will artists choose a quality level of art from their own perspective, which is far from that which would maximize their uh, money wage, far from that which would is most demanded by the public, and when will artists be more pushed or pulled towards that type and quality of art which the public most demands. A key factor is going to be whether an artwork is reproducible at low cost or not. So film, literature, and some kinds of music can be reproduced at low cost and without great loss of quality or value. Now an artwork that can be reproduced and distributed at low cost is going to have a very large potential audience, perhaps even in the billions. And a large potential audience is going to encourage artists to suppress their own tastes and to satisfy the market. So the larger the potential audience, the greater the temptation to move away from satisfying your own tastes and instead to grab up those monetary returns and satisfy the tastes of the market. So let's compare, for example, filmmakers and musicians versus painters. A filmmaker who adjusts the ending of his film in order to satisfy popular demand is going to vastly increase the number of people who may want to see that film and the revenues that that film may uh, receive. Musicians who change the tempo or the style of their music to satisfy the public may have their album go platinum, while without doing that it may only sell a few thousand copies. Painters, on the other hand, have much less of a temptation. A painter still has to eat, of course, but in a lifetime, a painter may be able to produce, let's say, a hundred major works. The way for a painter to increase their income is not so much to adjust their tastes, because they can't sell that many more anyway. It's instead to find those 100 people in the world, those patrons who have some money, whose tastes are most similar to those of the painter. So for this reason, filmmakers and musicians may feel themselves disliking the market or constrained by the market because the market is always pulling them back, is always telling them you've got to move closer away from your own tastes, closer to what the market wants. On the other hand, when a painter sells a new painting, the painter is likely to feel gratitude towards the buyer whose tastes he shares. The buyer is the person who allows the painter to, uh, to produce exactly what they want to produce. The buyer is the one who allows the painter to satisfy the painter's own desires. For the same reason, increases in market size increase the opportunity cost of producing for oneself. 
If the art market is small, then an artist who produces to satisfy his own desires isn't giving up very much. But as the market grows, that same artist is going to be more and more tempted to pull back on producing for himself and instead turn towards producing for that larger market. It's not surprising, therefore, that we often see claims that artists have sold out after being discovered. The idea is that an artwork was best in the early years. We see these claims being made about punk music before it was discovered, about Delta Blues and many other art forms. Many aficionados of Jackie Chan say that his best movies were the Hong Kong movies and that the quality of the movies declined as Chan moved towards the larger Hollywood market. Increases in market size don't always increase the temptation. When we're dealing with non-reproducible art, sculpture, for example, or painting, then an increase in the market size can actually encourage uh, greater artistic self-exploration because it means the chances of finding a consumer, a patron, who is, has similar tastes to the artist's tastes increase. So the Inuit sculpture, for example, uh, that art market has been greatly benefited by globalization, by being able to find customers all over the world who greatly appreciate this type of art. Without the increase in the market base, this type of art would have long faded away. So there's again a difference between the reproducible and the non-reproducible art. Why do some art forms, such as movies, tend to be oriented more towards popular or low culture, while others, such as paintings, tend to be oriented towards high culture and the avant-garde. We've already seen one explanation. When the art form is reproducible, there's a greater temptation of the artist to pull towards those larger markets, to satisfy market demands. But there are others. Artists receive non-pecuniary satisfaction from their art, but shareholders usually do not. In particular, capitalists are going to push capital-intensive arts towards popular culture. Some art forms require collaboration from the non-arts artists, and those non-artists are going to want to be more oriented towards market demands. Film is thus doubly popular. It's got a large market which tempts artists towards market demands, but it also has large capital costs. So filmmakers and directors, they've always got the capitalist over their shoulder telling them what to do, telling them you've got to do this in order so that we can recoup our costs. Painters are then doubly avant-garde because it has a small market and small capital costs. The painter does not have the capitalist over his shoulder telling him, you've got to add another bird in there. You've got to make it more blue. Again, for this reason, this is another reason why uh, directors may be particularly averse to capitalism, because the capitalists are always on their shoulder telling them what to do, pulling them back from their desires, telling them they've got to be more oriented towards the simplistic tastes of the market. These principles apply not just to artists in the traditional sense, but to anyone who cares about the production of their own good. So, for example, Tyler and I, in producing our textbook, we have ideas about what good economics consists of, what should be in a textbook, and what should not be in the textbook. But, of course, not everyone agrees, so we also face a temptation. Should we satisfy our own desires, or should we move closer towards what the market demands? And we've got capitalists on our shoulders as well, whispering in our ears. If only there were more on indifference curves, we could sell a lot more copies. So Tyler and I also face these temptations and constraints and decisions about whether to satisfy our own desires and how much and how much to go for the market. Ironically, perhaps, it's the rich societies, the market-oriented societies, which give the greatest scope for the avant-garde. On the demand side, a richer society creates a greater variety of demands for all kinds of art, including the avant-garde. And on the supply side, the richer the society, the more easily artists can satisfy their more basic desires, the greater the scope to produce art according to their own preferences. So a richer society allows the artists to move up the Maslow hierarchy, to move up from the desires of food and shelter towards those desires of artistic self-expression. So over time, with economic growth, artists begin to uh, 
satisfy their own desires more and more relative to the market desires. And this also explains why economic growth has created a divergence between high and low culture over time. Cultural commentators have shown that high and low culture have diverged over time. So Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, they were the rock stars of their day. That is, they were highly popular composers, but they were also highly esteemed and regarded by the cultural elite. Today, the composers highly esteemed by the cultural elite, Carter, Boulez, Babbitt, and so forth, are largely unknown to the mass public, and today's rock stars are rock stars, which is not to say that they're not great in their own way, but their output is consumed by an entirely different group of people than the cultural elite. There's going to be an increasing split between popular and high culture. We see the same thing with literature. Dickens, Balzac, Hugo were the best sellers of their time. Today, the bestseller list is dominated by Grisham, Patterson, and Bill O'Reilly, who are unlikely to be read 100 years from now. Shakespeare was very popular with the groundlings, with the people of low culture, but was also a part of the cultural elite, highly regarded. Today, again, we see very much less of that. It used to be quite common for the Pulitzer Prize list and the bestseller list to overlap. We see less of that today. It's increasingly unlikely. All of this follows from the economics which we've already laid out. As economic growth increases, artists become increasingly freed from the market. It becomes easier to satisfy your own tastes without giving up a reasonable standard of living. You may be giving up riches, but you're not giving up a reasonable standard of living. So economic growth actually liberates the artists from the market. The consumers may perceive such artists, the liberated artists, as being self-indulgent or nar narcissistic. In some ways they are. They are consuming their own product to a greater and greater extent as uh, the society's riches allow them to do that. At the same time, however, there are many more artists who uh, sell to the public. With economic growth and globalization, we get more and more artists going after the big markets. So we see a divergence over time between popular and high culture. For further resources, of course, take a look at our uh, academic article, which has got more on the model and so forth, more details that I've glossed over here. Uh, do buy Tyler's book, In Praise of Commercial Culture, a really groundbreaking and excellent book, highly recommended. Uh, you may also want to Google my piece on uh, capitalism, Hollywood's miscast villain, which was in the Wall Street Journal. Thanks.